you know, I have talked here in classes and forums and different things about different aspects of global surgery, but this was a great opportunity. I really want to thank you for it because uh, it's a chance to put all of our programs in perspective and in context and to make sure that we are aligned with the DJHI goals and with faculty interests. And this is a great chance to um, broaden our platform. You know, Dave Boyd and I, Dave got me started in this a few years ago. And it has really evolved into really what is still a little bit of a mishmash of projects and to those with some underlying themes. But I want people, I, I didn't want to talk too long today. Um, I want to keep it kind of short. But I want you to throw darts and I want you to, uh, to write down uh, issues and questions and things like that. Because in the end, um, this is a wonderful opportunity. To do this. Guys, come in. Don't be shy about getting food and things like that. All right. So as Randy mentioned, this is... Um, this is what I do for a day job. I'm across the street and I take care of children with surgical needs. And that is a complicated task to be sure. And every day is a little different and every day is a little challenging. And as I was putting together some thoughts for this, I sort of realized that some of the challenges that I face every day in the surgical care of children are not unlike the challenges in the population health, particularly for the surgical care of children. Uh, so before I uh, sort of dive into, you know, before I dive into what we're doing in Guatemala, I just kind of want just a couple thoughts, uh, a couple of challenges and contradictions, or maybe more politically correct opportunities for improvement. One challenge that I face every day, Dennis knows as well, and things when you take care of children is that we deal with small data sets. You know, children with congenital anomalies and other uh, rare disorders don't have a lot of data to make your clinical judgments on. So day by day, we have to do the best we can with limited data sets. The same problems face the surgical care of children. And so we make policy recommendations, economic analyses, all of these things really with not great data to fall back on. Uh, and it's just one thing that you have to face. Another second thought, just a contradiction, is, and Dennis knows as well, other people, Colleen, people take care of children, is that in most contexts, if you look at the evidence, people really value the health of children, right? If you look at an economic analysis, in general, people are more willing to pay for the needs of their children than they are for themselves. Any parents in the world know that. That hasn't really transposed to policy. That's not how we run healthcare children, right? Anybody that has taken care of a child and billed Medicaid realizes that our U.S. government values reimbursement for children's care far less than they do for other things. And so our emotional feelings, our, our objective economic analyses don't transpose to policy. And the end, children's surgical care is filled with these countries. So keep that in mind. All right. Let's get a little doggy downer first. Is that there is, again, some sort of global thoughts before we focus on our program. There is, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, a underlying concern in global health organizations that deal with surgical care that we remain very fragmented, and ineffective, and without governance, and so you just can't get the job done that needs to get done. And I think, I hate to say it, there's a lot of truth to it is that, this is just one thing, this is a fairly provocative report from this year, or just as recently, from Lancet Global Health, they did a qualitative analysis of big stakeholders in surgical care, and really came up with some kind of harsh feelings about the state of how we take care of children around the world. We don't do well at organizations, we don't address problems, we're sort of ineffectively put together, and there's just, it's just kind of, um, there's just an overburdening, uh, problem that can be really tough to face. So if you're going to get involved in improving surgical care, you kind of have to recognize this is a tough area. But there's a lot to be said for good things. All right. On the upside, I'm just going to say, I don't know if Gavin's here. I'm just, I don't want to say too much about this at all other than two things. This is a cover page of the Lancet uh, Commission on Global Surgery Report, which is a Landmark report came out a few months ago that Gavin Yimby of our uh, DJHS staff was led the Economics and Finance Committee on. Just 
want to mention two things about this report. This has really revolutionized how we think about global surgery. And one thing I want to recognize is that on, I want to remind people in just a few weeks, on February 17th, we'll be hosting a grand rounds, a combined grand rounds at 7 a.m., got to get up early, with John Muir, who's the lead author of this report, will be coming in with Gavin, who will be presenting a summary of their reports. I don't want to steal their thunder because it really is a, 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 a powerful piece of work to put it together. But one thing I want to mention about the Lancet report is that for people who are on the front lines of doing global surgery work, this has really evolved very quickly into a working document. This has been, it's, it's, it's challenging the fragmentation and it's challenging the sort of just angst that, that drives global surgery and it gives a prescription to move forward. In particular, it gives six areas for people to align their programs and to people focus their programs on to improve the healthcare uh, of people all over the world. And this really comes down to kind of a fundamental recognition that surgical care can't be separated from any other aspect of healthcare. It's a it's an integral part of a functioning health system, and you need to think about it in that context. But there are ways to uh, prepare yourself for surgical care, there's ways to deliver it, and there's ways to impact it. So I, I put this in context because um, what it does is it gives our program, it gives other programs at Duke, it gives other partners sort of a prescription to kind of move forward. And, and really what it challenges us all is to align our programs to these goals. All right, so that being said, that's the context where we put in our Global Health Project. And as Randy mentioned, this has been uh, now a project for six years running. That his, uh, our overall goal is to improve the surgical care of children in Guatemala. Uh, and it does it on a number of platforms, a number of tools, some of which, to be truthful, we do a lot better than others. Um, and these are designed specifically to align with DGHI goals and principles. And uh, it's helpful for us and for the people that we work with because when we develop a project or initiative, we sort of challenge ourselves to say, are we doing it in the context of, um, of these sorts of principles about working with local providers, about doing it on broad-based platforms? I will say we started out and we still have primarily a service-directed approach, although one of the challenges has been to extend that to uh, research and other educational missions. Um, and it's evolved, it's changing. And it, actually, this is a good time to talk here and to kind of think about how to broaden it further. Next please. All right, now you can't do it without a team. And these are really smart people who do this. Um, I sort of just put the slides together and they actually do the grunt work. Uh, you can see a good picture of Dave Boyd right there. At the bottom, Sherry Ross and Brad Teacher. Sherry is a pediatric urologist who was at Duke and now at UNC and has brought out these programs to involve a lot of UNC uh, staff, which is actually kind of a nice uh, sort of um, distinction from basketball rivalries to kind of keep things going along. Brad, I don't know if Brad's here. Brad's a pediatric anesthesiologist who leads uh, all of our anesthesia group and our CRNAs and other things to these efforts. Rachel Hall Clifford is a, a medical anthropologist, and Dan Pomeroy is a pediatric surgeon, is also a world-class medical economist who helps with our projects too. And I wish I had a place to put all our trainees and students. I don't have that, but what I do want to do is kind of talk about some of their work. All right, Mike Hagelin taught me a long time ago, you can't do things unless you talk to the people at the top and who do it here. And I, this is a picture of a, uh, Guatemalan Association of Pediatric Surgeons from just a few months ago when we were helping them lead a teaching seminar there. And our partnership with the surgical community in Guatemala has been um, a really nice one. It's one that's evolved and it's one that's challenging. As Randy mentioned, Guatemala is a challenging country to do healthcare work for many reasons, not the least of which is resistance among a lot of people from the medical community to recognize their own problems and to welcome engagement and partnership with others. But over the time, I will say that our partnership with a, with a pediatric surgery community has been wonderful. And it has evolved to one of sharing and partnership and recognition <coughs> and developing projects together. So now it's actually transitioning more to where we're following and we're helping out, but they're taking the lead on a lot of these issues. All right, so why Guatemala? Why in God's name would you pick a country that's so difficult to do global health work? And it really is challenging for so many different reasons. Uh, like many countries in, in uh, Central America, it is uh, got a high rate of poverty. It's got an extremely high rate of inequity. 
uh, in its population. So its Gini index is one of the highest in the world. It's got a high growth rate. Uh, it's got, for pediatric surgery, there are a lot of children in the country, right? It has a political context of a recent civil war. It has a more recent political uh, context of extreme amount of corruption. In fact, the, uh, just uh, several months ago, one of the recent presidents and vice presidents were indicted and now jailed for corruption, which has actually been a, a uh, tremendous opportunity to address global health issues. From a global health aspect, though, it's actually really interesting for all these reasons. Right? There's a huge indigenous population, so uh, it gets into all sorts of interesting questions about culture and beliefs and integration and globalization and how this is all evolving. All of these affect particularly for the care of children. The Guatemala health system, though, uh, it, it's a hard thing to explain. It's a really hard thing to understand. It is very similar on paper to a lot of other Latin American health systems, in particular in Central America, where it's a fragmented system where uh, people get their care through a combination of public and private sources. So in Guatemala, the large majority of the population get their care through uh, public sources, the Ministry of Public Health. And in some areas, it really does a good job. Their vaccine delivery rates, their other uh, uh, measures of primary health care are actually not bad at all. A portion of the population who have insurance through their uh, jobs get it through the social security system, and a small minority, I mean a really small minority of their population gets it through the private sector. But the majority of surgical care is disproportionately in these areas. So the Guatemala has the highest rate of out-of-pocket expenditures for care, as other parts of the public sector are sort of failing and acutely failing, more and more of it's being shifted to people paying out of pocket expenses. So for people who have to do that, they face all the challenges of impoverishing or destituting uh, economic care. I will tell you, just, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very interesting man. This is Dr. Rafael Espada, who is a cardiac surgeon, who's uh, now the dean of the medical school that we, one of the medical schools that we partner with, who is a past vice president, not the one who's indicted in jail, but he's one of the past vice presidents of Guatemala. And um, he actually has a very interesting perspective on the Guatemala health system. And he's writing a book about it, and he, I, did, I told him I wouldn't sort of spill uh, too many beans, but some of his words are, you just have to kind of shoot it and put it out to, of its misery and start all over. Uh, and he has a very sort of coarse look at it. Um, I will tell you that for surgical care, it's in an acute crisis right now. The, one of the big public hospitals, the biggest public hospital in Guatemala, has been closed to elective surgical care since last September. Right? So if you are an adult or child and need surgical care through the public sector, you cannot get it. There's no way to get it unless you have emergent needs. So over time, uh, other resources have filled this gap, and in particular, health-related NGOs have exponentially grown over the last 20 years. Now they're, if I'm a last count, probably several hundred, maybe even over a thousand NGOs who provide a large portion of the healthcare in Guatemala. NGOs and health-related care, particularly for surgical care, is extremely controversial. I, I don't want to sort of delve into that because there's upsides and downsides to it. But this is a, um, like many areas of the world, this is a, uh, a system that's in crisis, and these are ways that people get the sort of basic needs while the underlying costs are being addressed. All right, so within that context, what the heck do we do? I'm just gonna show you a few pictures. This is a picture of a primary health clinic at, uh, my family is actually down in, I can't remember the exact town uh, that it was. And when I was sitting out there at lunch one day and uh, nobody came in or out. It wasn't one person who sort of came in and out. I, we took a look at the site and I actually did some more investigating and it just wasn't really utilized. This is, in contrast, a uh, public health clinic. This is a pediatric clinic that's run by an NGO that we partner with that was busy all the time, right? These are, uh, these were lines outside there. It's colorful, people want to get their care there. It just sort of is a testament to the fact that people will align themselves and go to their best sources of care. And that's unfortunately the problem with Guatemala. All right, 
some, a lot of other lessons we've kind of learned as we've gone. Partnerships, like everybody in this room, are key to developing your, your projects. Um, and when you do this with surgical care, particularly for surgical care with children, it's been an honor and a challenge to be truthful to develop partnerships with a number of different funding organizations and universities and hospitals and things of that sort. I will say it's, it's been um, very interesting because really at the heart of it, what it does is you align people with different missions, with different goals, and with fundamentally different interests, and you kind of have to bring them together to work on a unified goal. And, that is improving the care of children. So for example, the NGOs that we work with, their donor base, their, their metrics, particularly when it comes down to surgical care, are generally geared toward high volume delivery of service. They want the most number of operations and the least amount of time and the least amount of money. Their interest is not necessarily in education and research and capacity building, <coughs> those things that are their dealing language. But over time, we have actually been able to work with them and to sort of bring them into this partnership. And now they sponsor a lot of our educational or research initiatives, which is actually um, really nice, <coughs> but it, it's something that evolves. Our programs uh, involve all sort of different levels of trainees and, and staff. Um, we always include our fellows and our residents and uh, our students to some degree. All of them who participate are responsible for a research or, uh, in most cases, a quality improvement initiative. So they take this as an opportunity to learn about global health needs, but also to, um, particularly with a relatively short time period and a short, small number of uh, children that are involved, to do something useful. And these are usually a number of QI programs. I don't want to uh, underestimate the value to Duke staff. This isn't something that we talk about very much, but across the street, it's a big deal. Um, is that Duke Medicine, Duke Health, has been strong supporters of this program. And so on some of our work, not all of it, we include Duke staff members for it. And I don't want to, I, I think it's a good lesson because it's really, I think, of great value to the staff members as a team building exercise, as a way to, for each of us to kind of learn about each other's roles in ways that you just can't do it here, as a way to build uh, enthusiasm, as a way to teach them about global health needs, as a way to teach them about cost containment, all sorts of really helpful lessons that a short-term exposure can be of, of great value. When we measure this objectively, and we ask all the staff members to rate the value of their experiences, they say uh, uh, across the board sort of similar uh, thoughts. So I think that's a good lesson for others. All right, let's kind of dive into it. Part of the challenge of the Lancet Commission and part of the charge that it's given is the need to, as I mentioned, expand the database, expand what we know about the care of children. Uh, and this is some work that um, Anthony Sexton, a DJHO, uh, second year grad student here, led, uh, where he did this is a systematic review of what is known, in this case, economic analyses of care of, uh, surgical care of children. This was one of the initiatives that was led by the Lancet Commission, but he applied it specifically to what the needs of children are. And he did a very in-depth review. And I will tell you that the nutshell is that if you look at, at the existing data set of what is known around the world about the economic analysis for surgical care of children, it's actually exceedingly small. And of that, most of the data is based on clinical studies that have included economic analyses. So the end result is these aren't the big economic analyses that you're used to dealing with HIV care or with something like that. These are based on small, non-standardized data sets that challenge the data quality, but it's a great thing to recognize because it gives you a way forward. But that being said, recognizing how limited the data are, there are some analyses. Uh, conclusions you can bring from it. If you look at cost effectiveness, if you look at the number of US dollars that are uh, required to avert dailies for different people, <coughs> and I will tell you for cost effectiveness purists, I recognize that this is not the way you do cost effectiveness analysis. You don't want to compare diseases or compare different treatments. You want to look at generally changes within the diseases or treatments. But that being said, you can see that for some areas, and this is different classes of surgical care for children, there's actually really cost-effective data out there that show that these are on par with other public health interventions like vaccine delivery or uh, mosquito netting or things like that, is that the, the concept, the underlying concern that 
surgical care is expensive and not feasible, it is not cost effective, it's actually probably not true. All of the data really does need to be made robust. There's certainly some procedures that offer more value than others. This is another way of looking at the data where it measures the societal economic benefit. This is using a human capital approach which basically is sort of measuring how much uh, income this child will produce over their lifetime, their expected lifetime, if their disease is treated surgically. And you can see that in this case, at the high end of the curve, this is how many dollars you will benefit from. And some procedures, particularly burn care and things like that, offer tremendous value. So what this does is it gives some context to uh, argue that these are of value, need to be supported, need to be expanded, even recognizing the data limitations. All right, so moving forward, Anthony came up with lots of things, but basically use of a standardized metrics like the daily metric and things like that need to be done. There's ways to do it. You can look at guidelines uh, of WHO and other guidelines to uh, advise people on what to do it. But really what it comes down to is expanding data sets and coming down to more robust data sources. All right, and as Randy was saying, what do we do in Guatemala? Well, this is a picture of the more uh, surgical center that is actually a really nice, well-run facility. It was built um, by U.S. charity dollars. Uh, and it is run in a way that U.S. surgeons, primarily, but not always, work alongside Guatemalan surgeons and U.S. staff work alongside Guatemalan staff to take care for children who don't have access to the public health or private health care system. So for people who need particular care, there is a very efficient screening process, and there's surgical clinics, and there's Guatemalan staff who will take care of their pre- and post-operative needs in really a very sort of high-quality fashion. This gives them an infrastructure to receive their care on. And so what this really is is a twinning experience. This is a partnering with people as we do it. And this is just a profile of one particular uh, trip that we went through where we will screen 100 children. We'll do about 50 cases over a one-week period, and we do this uh, uh, several times a year, maybe once a year, sort of depending on what it is. And it's a combination of kids with bread and butter problems like inguinal hernias that just simply can't get them fixed to very complex urologic or general surgical needs that, uh, that need them done as well. Uh, I want to talk just, a, I mentioned a little bit about some of the QI initiatives. I just want to mention kind of a few uh, that we've kind of learned. One challenge uh, in Guatemala and in other countries is uh, what are people's understanding of the role of different providers and how to uh, uh, sort of seek care within that thing. So this is a, a survey that we did. It's basically uh, sort of asking families all different perioperative care questions. Who actually does that? Does your surgeon do it? Does your anesthesiologist do it? Does your nursing staff do it? Does some other staff do it? And just to get a sense of what people's understanding of the process is, both in the public health system or more center. And what you find is that most families will recognize that the, an anesthesiologist administers drugs and things during your operation, but not many people recognize their role in the preoperative care or postoperative care, which is a challenge. So this gives us a tool to work with the anesthesia community to enhance their, uh, their understanding, their sort of profile there. And uh, they've actually been very receptive to it. Another thing. No one of the other sort of safe lessons not only of the Lancet Commission, but of a number of different initiatives, WH and otherwise, is the provision of safe surgical care, right? The provision of surgical care in itself is not enough. It has to be done in a high quality and a safe manner. And a number of different um, sort of initiatives, both in the U.S. and <coughs> industrialized countries, have uh, sort of standardized the use of checklists, of universal protocols, of ways to ensure that all of our procedures are being done in a standard fashion. Right, that we are validating the operation, that we are making sure that antibiotics are given if they're needed, that we're making sure the x-rays are available. Right? And this is just, these are all built on lessons taken from the airline industry, and there's a the lecture in itself. But the challenge in a country like Guatemala is that this is not part of the normal flow pattern. This just isn't done. So what we did is we did a uh, sort of uh, risk assessment uh, survey and said, well, what is the problem? This is at the Moore Center, but we've actually started similar surveys at some of the public hospitals and said that in just a little pilot group of 50 kids, over a third of them had the missing or incorrect operation on their consent form. 
So whatever was being done, many of them had incon identifiers. Their name tags were wrong. Their things like this. Things that wouldn't get you, that would get you barred from our operating room across the street are happening on a routine basis. And so what this gives is a, uh, it's just a tool for quality improvement. And it's a way that now we are actually initiating a whole training program and engagement. We're bringing down nursing staff and perioperative staff and to engage them and slowly over time get this as part of a culture. Hmm. All right, just a couple other uh, examples. There is, um, for those of you who work a lot with uh, Latino communities or, or uh, in either here or abroad, there is a uh, or fair otherwise, there is a, and objectively it's measured, there's a thought that the pain require, the pain needs, and I should say the narcotic requirements, right? so the recognition of pain in some populations is more easily detected than others. And so for those of you who work, for example, in uh, the obstetric world or something, that the narcotic uh, that is given to uh, Latino women in the U.S. are far less than are given to other populations. And it, it, so the question kind of arises when you deal with care of children, particularly when you cross language barriers and things, is that are we recognizing pain appropriately and are we treating it appropriately? And so this is a study where we compared objective versus subjective pain assessment. So objectively, in the US for example, if you measure how consolable a child is or how much they're crying, that is relatively similar to a subjective this is a long bigger face. These are this is a scale for young children that asks them to paint uh, to point to a, a face that says how much pain am I having? In the U.S., for example, in general, there's pretty good correlation between how uh, uh, objective assessment of a child's pain and subjectively how much they feel it. The question really comes in uh, in a different context in quite a long context. Are we doing this appropriately? And the short answer is no. So in this small pilot study. If you look at objectively, if you look at children in the post-operative setting, Guatemalan children, by and large, for whatever reason, are very stoic. They don't show many objective signs of having pain. And the corollary is Guatemalan healthcare providers are generally very stingy about giving pain medicine. About now, whether or not that's appropriate for children, it's not. If you ask children subjectively how much pain they're having, it actually far exceeds the amount of pain that people objectively assess. And so, as a consequence, most children who subjectively say they have pain aren't receiving their pain, uh, their sort of required pain treatments. And so, this again is another tool for quality improvement that we can use to address these things. All right, and one last one, I think post operative nausea and vomiting. Brad Tater, my partner, is coming in just at the perfect moment. Uh, there is post-operative nausea and vomiting, for anybody who's had a child that has undergone operation, is a huge concern for parents who go into it. In fact, it's kind of one of the main barriers for why people won't get surgical care for their children. They don't want them to vomit afterwards. And some populations are higher risk than others. There's, there's scoring systems that can predict your uh, outcomes. In the US, this is treated in generally with medications. Zofran or Dancitron and some other medications, quite effective, but very expensive and not really applicable to resource constrained environments. So I wish David were here this, and I'm going to offend everybody who does acupuncture in the world, but as, uh, Brad and his group have tested the use of acupuncture and other technologies to, that are being used um, a lot in other contexts towards the pain control of children who are pre-verbal and can't really tell you about their nausea and vomiting. And so this involves limiting the use of nitric oxide, narcotics, it involves pressure point, trigger points, the P6 meridian, if I get it right, that you can trigger intraoperatively and postoperatively uh, with pressure points, and to look at their postoperative nausea and vomiting sales. And using this, the short answer is it really works well. And so for children that have high preoperative prediction of having nausea and vomiting, if you do these interventions, you can see that if you predict they have a 26% risk of nausea and vomiting, their actual risk is less than half that. And so these interventions can actually be very effective and very uh, cost effective as well. All right, so if we go out of the clinical world for a little bit to some of our other interests there, as um, uh, we mentioned earlier, is that 
one of our other interests is in barriers to care. What sort of cultural barriers, what sort of other issues are really limiting access to care for children in Guatemala? So we've done a series of interventions. This is Dave Bhattacharya, who's a past resident, worked with us, who looked at a small pilot group of uh, parents with self-reported barriers to care. What was the effect of either financial or travel or other barriers to why they didn't get care for their children prior to that time? And you can see very similar to most low income countries in Guatemala, financial barriers are predominant. There's just no way around it. But what's different about Guatemala is there is issues of quality of care, of trust, of things that are kind of softer and are hard to uh, put your finger on and hard to address. But these are critical. Uh, particularly when you have a healthcare system that's in crisis. So we kind of dived into a little bit more and we took some tools. This is um, uh, Brian Gulak, who's one of our group, and he did, he used some uh, tools of behavioral economics. And he did both ranking and rating studies. And this is kind of akin to, uh, for those that don't know, these are the um, surveys that you do if you go to a grocery store and somebody sits you at the end of the aisle and you say, would you like to have, um, you know, this or that, or, or, or tell me why you would pick that versus that. So it tries to kind of, you know, quantitatively uh, have people work through their different barriers. And if you look either at ranking or rating, which are two different sort of ways to approach it, again, the cost of surgery and waiting time for surgery are high, but quality of care and trust remain um, predominant. And this is kind of an underlying uh, theme. And finally, we did some qualitative research. This is um, Ben Silverberg, who's a master's student here from a couple years back, who did a, uh, some semi-structured interviews of family and really kind of delved into the details of all of their views of barriers to care. And he did a content analysis where he basically took a transcript of what they did. And he measured both quantitatively and qualitatively the underlying themes and, and how much uh, these affect them. And you can see not only are financial barriers and opportunity costs most effective, it's I want to highlight the bottom, it's mistrust, it's fear. They, they, in a big segment of the population, particularly for care of children, where you are trusting your child to people who you've never met before, who don't speak your language and things like that, there is some inherent mistrust and fears, not only of um, uh, sort of strangers from abroad, but really more uh, applicable are, is the underlying public health care system. And this is really what keeps people from surgical care for their children. All right, that being said, I don't want to be such a downer. These are big challenges, but they're opportunities. They're ways that either Duke or some of our other partners can kind of partner together and kind of address these. So I got to sort of end on an up note. Uh, and there really are some things that you can do. This is a um, laparoscopy and thoracoscopy training course that we uh, led just a few months back there. And this was attended by pediatric surgeons from across Central America that really have a thirst for uh, bringing their levels of care, their use of technology up to world standards. Recognize that they have resource constraints and they have to do it in a cost-effective manner. So we constructed this whole course in ways to do state-of-the-art laparoscopy and thoracoscopy care for children, which is using small telescopes and different body cavities, but to do it in a cost-effective manner. Uh, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it. This is just a, a trained course of a lab that we did. In the U.S., we would have fancy simulators, and we'd have computers, and people would time you your task. And I don't want to offend Gene or any of some of my residents, but this, these are dramatically underused in U.S. training. This is using um, some wooden boxes and some fish hooks to do similar tasks. I couldn't get these trainees out of these labs. They, we were set to do a three hour period. They wanted to stay six hours. And we gave them all the equipment to go home with to actually use it when they were done. So these are for trainees across Central America. <coughs> they, they have a thirst for these uh, educational programs. And again, it's another avenue uh, for improvement. Couple last thoughts. Um, I think, uh, although we, uh, the DJHI do, we emphasize from an educational standpoint, our own trainings. We emphasize uh, vertical learning platforms. We emphasize integration, but we direct it towards our undergraduates, our graduates, our, our various healthcare students, our various other students in other schools. There really is value in what is an underutilized um, or underused role of that of reciprocal training, of bringing trainees of different needs to the US. And this is done 
all the time by different groups around here in different clinical arenas or in different uh, sort of science arenas, but it's done in a very haphazard fashion and it's not done as effectively. And I think this is a this is a real um, this is a real opportunity for Duke. I will tell you, from a clinical standpoint, um, we brought our first group of Guatemalan trainees in anesthesiology and in surgery here last year. And we found that just fundamental principles of making an individualized, standardized curriculum to enhance what is not available for them is absolutely essential. And this really isn't done that often. I will tell you, there are some, um, there are some real barriers at Duke, and I hate to say this, to get us done. There is, for better or worse, there is currently a limitation from Duke Hospital of uh, medical trainees who are not attending level, but uh, rather uh, trainees who are still in their training, to limit them to two weeks. So our international care office limits anybody from abroad to two weeks. And this just is, and this is based, I think, years ago somebody overstayed their visa and um, people didn't like it. So years back, the um, the hospital administration has never allowed any base every two weeks. And that goes across all specialties and sort of this immutable law written in stone. I think that makes it a real challenge. And so for those of us who have led these programs, we sort of talked in loose terms about uh, trying to engage people to, to change this. I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, and then also, uh, to, this is one of the areas in in global surgery, in our education programs, there's tremendous administrative burden and cost of doing this. And most people do, do this in their own silos. And they do this by their own clinical department, if they're doing it clinically, and they do it without engagement of others. There's a really high administrative burden to get this done. And this is something that economies of scale would make a lot of sense. You were asking about that. All right. So for example, there are a lot of tools here. These are. Um, uh, Danielle and Gustavo are Guatemalan uh, trainees. Danielle's an anesthesiologist and Gustavo's a uh, surgeon training. They work in our human safety and patient simulation lab that Brad works with with the Department of Anesthesiology across the street. And we constructed a pediatric uh, OR crisis to test how well they communicate with each other. They loved it. This is when we sort of sat down and debriefed afterwards and kind of went over all of their, uh, their reaction skills and ways they can improve it. These are technologies that aren't available and, and these are things that when we bring people up, we, we focus our training on these sorts of efforts, we can have tremendous effort. So these offer great uh, educational opportunities and also research opportunities as well. All right, and finally, this is the last slide, Randy mentioned at the very beginning. This is just the tip of the ice. Uh, for those, that, and I think you'll find from the Lancet Commission uh, presentation, and we actually have a full day of I'm just going to sort of blanket invitation for those who are interested. On February 17th, not only for the grand rounds, but after that we're having a whole morning of uh, formal and informal presentations on all of our global surgery programs across all different departments. And people are welcome to that, including a working lunch on strategic alignment to improve our programs at Duke, and I encourage anybody to come. But as part of the, in the spirit of alignment, we have brought together uh, faculty across different schools and different clinical departments to put together a seminar on global surgical care uh, based in large part on the Lancet Commission report and their recommendations. And this will be given in fall of 2016, designed for undergraduates, for graduates, for medical students, for clinical trainees, for faculty, anybody who wants to get engaged and learn about the many uh, areas of global surgical care. And it's now going to involve uh, a little bit of clinical care, but because there are going to be people at different levels, we'll focus up more on surgical care management, and economic analyses, and policy development, all those sort of tools that our people need to, to work not only in surgical care, but with our people who are working in other areas of the health system to recognize the role of surgery in a comprehensive health system. We're incredibly excited about this, so I encourage for those that want to <coughs> dive more into it, we're going to parse the literature and delve into it, and lots of projects and fun stuff. So at the end of the semester, people will have the necessary tools to go on. All right, and I think, I hope, that is all. But I'm not going to say anything more. Yeah, that's all right. Anyway, this is an honor to kind of work with. You know, it, it humbles me to get a chance to get involved with these programs, to work with such um, expertise across the DJI and across the parts of Duke Health System. This has been a tremendous boon, not only for myself, but I think it's really offered value to a lot of people this community. And uh, 
and I welcome chance to broaden it and questions, anything you guys want to do, throw away. Don't be shy now. Did the dentist come right after you um, brought all the <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's not a shortage of sugar. Right? <laughs> I hate to ask, but there's a picture we had that they were covered with actually some candy and some uh, powder or something, and uh, about 20 minutes later, they're all covered in white sugar. That's all I got before that. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did you, uh, saw a hand? No. Anybody hands? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Got a question. Sure. Right. So I wanted to follow up on the um, capacity building. And you showed a couple of slides of the course that you ran in Guatemala, had people come in from the region. What are some of the <clears throat> challenges for mobilizing resources for that? Not only running the course, but paying for people's travel. To come no, that's right. Um, so, really, I hate to say it, most of my time is actually writing emails and getting people to give money. Uh, and, and the course, would, that's why I spent most of my time. This was sponsored by U.S. and primarily by U.S. laparoscopy companies who routinely offer training courses for um, U.S. trainees. And it's just like drug companies or people like that. It's engaging with trainees at a young level, and there's a lot of branding and things like that. It's done under in the U.S. under uh, ACGME restrictions, so you can only do so much advertising. Most of these companies, the challenge is most of these companies are not actively engaged in global health work. And so I actually had to fly out to L.A. to meet with some of their leadership to convince them that this was of value. And not only, once it got past that level, not only was it they were happy to support the, the course, they actually gave $400,000 worth of laparoscopy equipment to, to build up the center. So uh, they recognize that this is, again, of value to their company. It's in line with the company um, goals, and it just takes a lot of coaching to get it there. Any questions? So thanks for the presentation. I'm, sure. I'm curious. Um, so you had mentioned here, and I kind of got from the presentation, that the people who benefit most from a lot of the collaborations Duke has are actually Duke people, staff, faculty, uh -huh. students. Right. And I'm wondering what the capacity building is, what, what kind of things are being done in, on site to build capacity locally? Uh, That's a great question. Uh, and I sort of alluded to it at the beginning, is that um, <coughs> like any global health project, this evolves over time, and uh, the the system that we work in, we have had to push the system to transition this from a US-led operation to a Guatemalan-led operation. So currently, we have evolved really from taking Duke faculty and staff and students in large part to one of Guatemalan trainees now coming uh, and assist us, to Guatemalan staff assist us. And we use this platform as, a, um, as an interactive twinning side-by-side -side so the research and the things that you saw was generally led by U.S. students and trainees, but over five years we're actually changing that model, one that, to be truthful, we need to do more of, and that's, that's one reason why I'm actually glad to have this platform, because I know that needs to get done. That's, it's a challenging country to do that in, um, but in the end, that's what needs to get done. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think you have touched upon, upon a little bit about this, but uh, could you uh, explain a little bit more about the partnerships that you mentioned? Like, uh, there are, I know there are a lot of organizations involved in these projects. Uh -huh. So what are the roles of different organizations, especially in Guatemala? Uh -huh. And also like uh, the Social Security Institute you mentioned. Could you talk Yeah, uh, boy, uh, how, to, how to explain the Guatemalan health system uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, well, it's a very fragmented system. I mentioned so there, there are providers across all specialties but particularly in pediatric surgery that are very well trained are capable uh, and able <coughs> and in a perfect world there's actually ideally almost an adequate number of providers in Guatemala um, as, in contrast to sub-Saharan Africa and things like that it, so it's not the numbers or the training of the providers that's the issue it's access to these providers so the partnerships that we do are designed in some way, shape, or form to match providers with ways to access the system. I guess that's probably the simplest way to, to mention. So that is working primarily through the leading medical schools there, through the universities, so we have access to their trainees and clinical trainees. It's working through the big hospitals there so that 
their trainees will be excused from their duties at the public hospital that is closed to surgery anyway, uh, and that they'll get clinical experience by working with us. Uh, and it's ways to work, really proud is that this for the first year, that group of pediatric surgeons that I showed at the beginning, for the first year, they're actually committed to taking over some of the functions of the Moore Center. So they are now using this infrastructure as an alternative resource to provide surgical care for children so that, like you were asking about capacity building, that is the end goal. The end goal is obviously to make us obsolete and not having to go there. And it's slowly evolving towards that. That's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm new here at DGHI. I work with Dr. Hagman. Uh -huh. And so I'm planning on writing a grant, uh, grants for increased surgical capacity. Uh -huh. What I'm finding is I have to keep backing up where I thought it would be, we'll just put X number of certain machines in there. Now I'm at the basement level of how do you even measure surgical capacity within a healthcare system? Welcome and what to I, the system. I'm sorry? <laughs> Welcome to the system. I know, that's right, that's right. <laughs> what I found is there's not one developed for children and that have pretty specific needs in adults, so I was wondering if you could speak to no, that. No, that, I alluded to that at the very beginning. It's one of the underlying challenges in surgical care is data sets and ways to engage and ways to roll this out. The Lancet Commission as well has, has really pushed that. In short, you are absolutely right, is that those technologies have not been applied towards the surgical needs of children. And for better or worse, the surgical needs of children are different in many ways, not all, but in many ways than the surgical needs of adults. Building surgical capacity will have beneficial effects for the surgical needs of children. Absolutely. Build infrastructure, you will enhance the surgical care of children. But there is a real gap in the recognition of the differences in surgical needs of children, of safety differences, of training differences, of staffing differences, of medication differences, of all the things that are the core elements to a system have not, you are absolutely right, they have not been as well developed for children. There's some resources, maybe offline, I'll be happy to help steer you to some. Okay. And it's always a pleasure to work with my <coughs> and I've worked with them for many years. And I always learn something from the process, but there are tremendous opportunities to broaden your platform as well. Dennis. Uh, what about uh, resources when you're there in the way of IV tubing and IV fluid and needles and catheters and just the logistics? How do you get the job done? Um, it's a bit of a patchwork. Uh, I wish I could say, Brad and I spend a lot of our time with Emily and, and the other staff in, in this setting. This is, again, this is almost, um, I would sort of liken this, this is not all that different from um, a relief effort, if you will, about going to Haiti, about uh, um, Doctors Without Borders, about their sort of efforts, and that you um, have to bring your whole capacity with you, and that involves medications. IVs and things of that sort. So what we do is put together money to supply, to buy those, and really, for those that we can't get on site, transport to bring those down. And so there are a number of relief organizations that do these. These don't, these are, it's sort of a, a thorn in our side. My, my particular side is that this is not a valuable use of our efforts, although it, it's the only way to get care, really, fundamental change in the system is down. It's just hard to do that when the public health system is closed down. They just simply aren't. And for years, you know, our, our predictor surgical colleagues would kind of go into the OR and if there weren't gloves that day, they would cancel their cases for the day. I mean, they would, it's that sort of system that you're working into. And so, um, but you know, you meet with the dean, you, you sort of engage yourself with governance, you, you kind of do the things that take years to evolve and you kind of uh, clean up these things. and change is slow, but it's coming, it's steady, you know. Um, we wouldn't keep going back into work. Brad, you got any thoughts along those lines? That's spot on. <laughs> All right. Well, nothing else, thanks so much. Thank you.